Hello, good morning or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you might be. This is The Apollo Detectives. It's November 2021 and we are back. I am Ben Emlyn Jones and I'm joined by my three colleagues here. It's just three of us at the moment, but others will be joining us in other productions. It is Neil Geddes Ward. Hello, Neil. Hi, Ben. Hi, Marcus. Hi, Rasa. Good to be back. We've been a while, so it's good to catch up with everybody. You too. And we have Mr. Nexus himself, Marcus Allen. How are you, Marcus? I'm well, thank you. We just got the new edition of Nexus out. It'll be on the newsstand next week. Oh, great. I've just uh, I've just finished re reading the uh, previous one. It's very interesting. It is. And all the way from China, we have Raza Vihari once again for his second visit, I believe. Hello, Raza. Hello. How We're celebrating going? the uh, the recent uh, Chang'e mission and the rocks which were brought back, which were different from the Apollo rocks. Ah yes, that's right. The uh, maybe we'll be we'll get into that because of course China has been having a lot of success in its moon missions at the moment. So that, I'm sure that's very interesting. Also, we have coming up um, the Artemis mission apparently, which is a a manned rocket which is going to launch the moon sometime. It's going to be 2024. Now it's not. Um, I guess we'll find out. But anyway, uh, it's going to be a great show. So thank you everyone for watching. Keep watching. There's more coming up. OK, cool. So getting back to the Artemis one, whilst we're before we do some presentations here, I, I've been following the Artemis thing loosely. I know they've been trying to assemble everything and test rockets and uh, they've had issues with spacesuits. Um, it's I think presumably these are the problems that are holding it up. Uh, initially, they had this window of 2024 to try and get everything up there. Uh, they now thought that was a bit ambitious. So they've now put it back to 2025. Um, any any uh, kind of updates or any more information yeah. on that? Anybody? Well, Scott, yeah. Scott, so we're here. First of all, can I jump in? Is that the, yeah. um, there's the one which is being delayed is Artemis three. So Artemis two is not being delayed, and actually Artemis two is the one to watch. So they 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 still got it announced that the May 2024 Artemis two. The reason Artemis 2 is important is because they're going to send human beings around the moon. The one which is being delayed is the landing flight. That's being okay. pushed off to 2025. You know, so but for me, I just I'm I want to see two Artemis 2 because if they can actually go around the moon, then you know, we're going to have to look at what kind of radiation and shielding they have. Yeah. Yeah, well, Apollo 8 apparently managed it in 1968, so uh, we'll uh, we'll wait. We'll have to see. I mean, I'm sure if Scott were here, uh, he would he would be telling us about um, that. Uh, he would be telling us all about the the seals on the spacesuit and about whether they work in the vacuum of space. I'm sure he'll have a lot to say about that in a future show. But um, right. I I didn't know. I thought there was just one mission. I didn't know there was more than one. But um, of course, an orbital a mission orbiting the moon. It would be would it be like Apollo eight? It would actually go into lunar orbit and then come back right. again. Right, and they so the um, it's called the powerhouse. It was assembled in Europe, and they just sent it over on a plane to America. And the powerhouse is the radiation shielding chamber for the Artemis two mission, and they are not releasing information. What is that? It's like a, a square box that the astronauts live inside called the powerhouse because all of the environmental controls are inside that box. And you don't find much information like what is this, what are the sides of the ship made out of? In my, it's probably some kind of a bizarre 3D printed material, which is what, which is what um, Tesla is doing in their Starship, their man mission. Well, if it were, uh, I mean, if there's several materials. I mean, we know that like, uh, like plastic can protect from um, alpha and beta particles. You need uh, heavy metals to protect against gamma rays, which of course are very heavy things like lead, very heavy, uh, and they add a um, lot. Of, it's a lot of complication to the mission if they have to launch a payload that large. Yet, um, uh, let me just say that um, it's also very interesting because this was the um, the recent. SpaceX that flew the um, non astronauts, right? Private citizens. Mm. Yeah. Yep. So that was the highest flight that human beings have ever taken. 
a lot of people don't realize that the previous record was when the space shuttle went to fix the um, the Hubble telescope. That's right. Yeah. Right? So that Hubble telescope that was um, that's 559 kilometers. So that was the previous record, and now this Dragon Two Crew Dragon flight number two was 580 kilometers. So they went farther than the previous records. And how did they do that? Okay, so I've tried to, you know, Elon Musk has a lot of secrets about how his spaceship is made, but I was able to dig up a few things. So the inner cavity, the inner cavity of the spaceship is made out of a special 3D printed material called Iconel, Inconel. That's just the name they because they had the patent. It's this very special chemical mixture that's being 3D printed, specially designed to pre prevent radiation. And then the space suits themselves are also made out of a special material they invented called Nomex. And that material also 3D, they measure the people's body and they 3D print the suit to fit all their joints perfectly. Because it's it, the space suit itself is made out of a special material for uh, get protecting from radiation. You know, so it's very special, top secret materials they're using in both the spaceship and the space suit. And that's just to just to get them up, you know, to 580 kilometers. I was wondering if um, past Marcus could comment on this. I was wondering about the. Uh... The, the, um, the season, the solar season we're in at the moment, because we're actually out of the solar minimum now, and it's now we're now going up towards the solar maximum. I wonder if it, does that affect, for example, solar radiation, of course, is affected, but also galactic cosmic rays, X-ray, gamma, neutron, that kind of thing. Yes, those are the uh, those are the main, most dangerous parts of what humans will meet in space. Whether it's whether it can be protected. Um, I mean, Russ has explained it very well in terms of what they have used on SpaceX. But how much testing has been done with SpaceX and humans in space? It, it's, it, it, it seems to be very much, they can see the problem, they can see that it has to be solved, and they're desperately trying to solve it. Whether they are doing it the right way, whether they will actually protect anything because going up 500 and odd kilometers is not even touching the lower Van Allen belts. Those are about 600 miles. That's part of a thousand kilometers. So they haven't really got into any unpleasant areas of space. Now, whether they're going to or not, and you know, uh, let alone launch anything through the Van Allen belts, because it takes two hours to uh, launch through them, I don't know. And by now, with Apollo, they had already launched Apollo 8 on lunar orbit. And they'd obviously found that it wasn't a problem because they then continued to do it. Uh, Apollo, Apollo 9 didn't go into uh, um, the Van Allen belts. Apollo 10 did, and so on down. So obviously, something worked for Apollo, or we've been persuaded to believe that something worked. Now, if SpaceX believe that, that Apollo solved the problem, and they're now trying to duplicate what Apollo did, they may well have a major problem on their hands in trying to duplicate what Apollo did over 50 years ago. 1968, Apollo 8, December 1968. It was, it's, it's, a, it's a strange time we live in, because people are continually saying, Oh, it's no problem. You know, we can just fly out there. We can protect our astronauts from all the dangers of space. But they haven't actually got the parameters of what the dangers are. Have they, have they sent craft through the Van Allen belts to measure the levels of radiation? No, they'll mm -hmm. say that they have, but I, don't, I have never found any testing that's been done. The the only ones we know of, I mean, there was <coughs> the Van Allen belt was sounded by Explorer One. Um, I think there may have been others, but certainly a full survey of the, the radiation has, yeah. has never its intensity, the height of the belt, how thick they are, things like that. But um, isn't there, um, 
it say, should be mentioned that be, prior to 2012, we knew almost nothing about the Van Allen belts. It wasn't until the Van Allen probes went up in 2012, yeah. and there were two probes measuring the, the belts by sending signals through the belt. Then we started to get a picture of what really the Van Allen belts are. Yeah, because mm-hmm. that by, I mean, obviously the, the Apollo. The, the the official explanation as well they they went through the belts very quickly but in, in terms of apollo 8 and the later missions we the, the manned missions that went to the moon allegedly we they didn't know at that time they were taking a huge risk with those astronauts yeah exactly so in, have the, have the chinese in their more recent launches to the uh, into lunar orbit have they been testing the van allen belts as they've gone through them have they been measuring what they yes, have in front. Of course. Of course. So if, if they'd got the if they've got the figures, obviously they're not releasing them because it would conflict right. rather with with Apollo. Exactly. They're not going to blow the whistle on Apollo like that. No, exactly. Which, which is funny because I've been studying a lot of in, in recent times the, the talk of how to protect from the cosmic radiation is increasing. You know, there's the TEDx and People, and this is a very delicate subject because you're on the er- verge of blowing the whistle on NASA. Yeah. You know? So it's interesting to see how they're kind of dodging that subject of talking about radiation but not blowing the whistle on NASA. Yeah. Mm. Now, wasn't it Bart Subrail was trying to get information uh, from either about the radiation tests that were done recently or was it from the, something to do with the sun? And he said that they wouldn't release the information about what was the power of the radiation emanating from the sun because it was classified. And he said, how can something be classified that's part of nature? I remember something about that. Yeah, that's actually described in his book, Moon Man. Yeah. So that's odd, isn't it? Yes, that they would. I mean, surely wouldn't they just publish them? I mean, the Soviets used to, used to publish their data, I mean, for, all, for the whole scientific community. Yeah, they did. Um, why and NASA did as well. So why now is how can you classify exactly? Why can you classify simply uh, uh, something that is purely surely of interest? You know, it's not a it's part not a of secret. Nature, rock, uh, as yeah, said, it's part of nature. Part of nature. Yeah. Yeah. Because now yeah. uh, there are enough people around who can analyze that information and work out how humans have to be protected. Mm. Fifty years ago, that wasn't possible because we didn't have the information. We didn't know what was going on. We were told, "Oh, they just travel through the Van Allen belts very fast, so we weren't affected." That's nonsense. Yeah, there's um, you know, two hours of exposure to the radiation levels in the Van Allen belts and beyond. People tend to forget it's not just the Van Allen belts that cause the problem; it's all the space beyond them mm-hmm. on the way to the moon. That's full of radiation. As, yeah. you, as you put it once in your program with John Ronson, Marcus, um, you're naked before creation. Yeah. And, and we don't, and again, what, what is it? I mean, we know that the, there's solar radiation during the solar maximum, which reaches a high intensity. X-ray, yeah. you know, flares release a lot of x-rays, which are very, very dangerous. They can kill you easily. And then, of course, there's the solar minimum, but then you have galactic cosmic rays, which, which become more intense during the solar minimum. Yeah. Um, yeah, you you do. I mean, and a lot of diagrams for designs for spacecraft in some, I, I, you know, little kids' books. I got the Osborne Guide to Space Exploration or something like that when I was a little kid. It showed a design for a deep space craft for journeys to the moon and planets and things like that. It had a something inside it called a storm cellar, which is basically a chamber sur- surrounded by heavy metals and tanks of water, which astronauts could go into during a uh, coronal mass ejection. Um, and Kim Stanley Robinson in his Mars trilogy, the, the, the spaceship which takes in the story which takes the, the astronauts to the moon, to, so to Mars, has that structure within it. it. Indeed, it has to be used at one point during the, during the mission. Um, and if you, if you can't, if, without that, you'd be dead. You'd be killed immediately without, without, yeah. um, without that storm cellar if you could, didn't go into the storm cellar. And in, in, the, in the recent... Uh... The recent uh, TV series that they're showing them hiding in the cave, you know. When the-
when the radiation comes, they have to run to the cave. Yeah. That's another option. But I wanted to mention about this. You were talking about the galactic radiation versus the solar radiation. And okay. Yes, what you said was correct. When it when it's a solar maximum, the solar winds actually block out a little bit of the cosmic radiation. So to NASA's favor, we can say, okay, actually it's almost better to go during the solar maximum. You know, but either way, the whole idea is ridiculous because, you know, okay, this kind of deadly radiation is a little bit better than this kind of deadly radiation. So it's like either way. <laughs> You know, it's, you're gonna die either way. <laughs> that's why I do my, that's why I do my space weather reports on my radio show, Hapanlo, the Hapanlo show, because um, to monitor this sort of thing. That's one of the reasons I do it. And I know that during the solar maximum, coronal mass ejections, which is like a a billion hydrogen bombs going off all at once and flying towards you, um, these things can happen randomly at any time. Sometimes they 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 can they, they appear within days from sunspots which just emerge immediately, and they're so they're so fast that they can actually cover the distance between the Earth and the Sun within eight hours. The fastest one, um, which means you you cause actually havoc with our, even on the Earth's surface with electric power and communications and things like that. Um, for an astronaut in space. It, it would be it would be curtains unless you know, unless there's some means of protecting yourself, which is why I do, really people shouldn't buy NASA's line. The, the, the line is basically well, we were kind of lucky, you know, or we had a plan. We we just rotate the spacecraft a bit, and that would be enough. That's um, it's easy yeah. to say that afterwards, isn't it? I think I think it's an interesting thought. point about the rotation of the spacecraft, the the barbecue thing that they often refer to, where they're on their way to the moon, they're they're um, supposedly rotating the craft to yeah. get the heat sort of absorbed equally on all sides and things, which sounds a, a moderately, you know, scientific principle to use. But when they've actually landed on the moon, and it's in the case of Apollo 17, they're like three days on the moon or something, how can you possibly rotate the lunar module? All the people, all the guys landed on the moon. Suits. You can't. I mean, I suppose, like, what I would do if I was planning this mission, I'd say to the guys in the spacesuits, you know, you're going to have to go stand in the shadow every so often for, for a little while and cool off because you have this big contrast on the moon between with, between light and dark, between where the sun shines, it's very hot, it's 80 degrees centigrade. Where the, where the shadow, it's like minus 119 or something like that, minus 120. Um, so you'd, 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 be get, you'd be protected for a short time because – but no no – no uh, thermal insulation is perfect, and sooner or later you're going to get hot in your spacesuit, and you're going to have to cool down. Where do you go? You have to go and stand in the shadow. But you never see any of them. I don't know if even there is any shadow for them to stand in. Well, it's a um, lunar module shadow. You can stand in that for a bit. I, know, I don't see them doing that, though. So No, they, I, think, I think it's Apollo 15. They put their space telescope uh, there, so it's presumably to sort of take shots of the night sky or something, or the moon sky or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, so they were in there briefly to, to erect that up, but uh, uh, most of the time they're out playing golf. <laughs> if you stayed in the shadow too long, you'd start to get very, very cold indeed. Yeah. yeah. And, can I, can okay. I add one thing? You talked about this, um, this luck thing. NASA got lucky. And this just really cracks me up. This one debunker came into the group. He sent an article. I didn't even read it because it's so ridiculous, but it's called like NASA got lucky. And they're talking about, I think it was Apollo 16. There was a solar flare just before Apollo 16 and the solar flare right after Apollo 16. So they got lucky. They were in between the two solar flares. It's such a ridiculous article. Yeah. In, in fact, that was the uh, conclusion reached. I, I attended a lecture at the British Interplanetary Society given by a scientist from the Harwell Nuclear Institute near Oxford who investigate these sort of things and they were talking about radiation in space and they were talking about protecting astronauts from the radiation in space and they mentioned that um, solar flare August the 4th I think it was 1972 between Apollo 16 and Apollo 17 and actually I asked them I said how were they protected from the problems of radiation in space because they, they seem to to duck through it and her answer was it was the luck of apollo <laughs> i mean the luck of apollo, that's, what, <laughs> that's what they're relying on and that's probably where that remark came from it's easy it's easy to say that afterwards 
course. when everyone's home, they're also even there was no major malfunctions. Apollo 13 was the only major malfunction, and even that ended happily, which was incredible. Um, but beforehand, you, it's not so easy to say that beforehand when you're planning the mission and you know everything's going to be on TV. Everything, you know, if something goes wrong, everyone's going to know about it. Yeah. Um, these guys, they won't. If they die, it'll, you know, it'll be televised. Well, this is the thing. The luck of Apollo seemed to work very well for the ships getting there and coming back again. But anyone who spoke out against Apollo during that time did not seem to have the luck of Apollo. They seemed to have the reverse. <laughs> so you've got Gus Grissom and his colleagues. They started to speak out, or certainly Gus Grissom did. So he did not have the luck of Apollo on his side at that point. Then you got uh, the guy who was the uh, uh, inspector. Baron, uh, the, yeah, Thomas Baron, Baron. Thomas Baron, who was... Uh, again given a press conference and talking about the mishaps of apollo and things like that and unfortunately he did not have the luck of apollo and he came to a very unfortunate end with his family a uh, railroad crossing which someone said was the train was actually that hit the car was owned by nasa i don't know if that's true but that's what i heard and then the car <laughs> that's very the unlucky car just, the car just happened to break down on a level crossing yeah I mean, that's, yeah that and is the safety inspector very unlucky. You know, yeah that is people. very unlucky yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Here's a question for all the people who think Apollo 13 was real. How many Apollo 13 command modules are on display, public display in America right now? Two. Oh, yeah. On two, right. There's, one, there's one in London, but I didn't know there were only two in a... No, the, uh, the uh, one in London is the Apollo 10 command module. Mm. Uh, the Apollo 13 official command module is on display at the Kansas, Kansas Cosmodrome. But also the Grand Rapids Museum have another Apollo 13 command module. <laughs> Though they will call it, and it's on public display and it's been sealed for 100 years. It was put on display in 1976. It was going to be on, it was going to be sealed for 100 years to the 300th anniversary of founding of America. What's it doing there if, it, if it's the official command module. I don't know if it is the official command module. People will say it's the boilerplate version that was fished out of the Atlantic by the Soviet Navy the day after Apollo 13 launched and returned to America in some, six months later. It just, was, yeah. it just seems a very odd story because nobody had said there was a command module missing. It would be a danger to shipping. They're quite big. They weigh about seven or eight tons floating around in the Atlantic and that's a long way from uh, Florida and it's definitely way off course for any uh, Apollo mission because that would go out over Africa it wouldn't go out over the Bay of Biscay which is where it was found so the Soviet Navy hauled it out of the out of the sea took it back to their base in Mamansk in northern Russia handed it back to America who put it on display four months four years later What's going on? Well, it's if not this, discussed. If, uh, if there are two that claim to be the Apollo 13 um, command module, and the, the command module is the only part of the entire Saturn rocket that ever comes back to Earth. Yeah. That's the only bit. That's the bit with the, with the people and the pressure hull and the people. Um, surely they would... It, you can't really mistake, make a mistake about which one's which. You shouldn't be able to. It should be very obvious because th we know when they land. We know they're fished out at the sea. But the astronauts are, are taken aboard this aircraft carrier, and um, the I think I know it's a risk. That some, sometimes they one of them sank at once. Well, did one sink? I, I wasn't. It wasn't. No, it wasn't Apollo. It was another mission. But one of the Gus one Christmas. of the command modules sank. Yeah, luckily, oh, now this was at sea. Luckily, the astronauts did get out before the thing sank. But the actual, I think it was a Gemini, I think mm. one of the Gemini mm. sank and uh, it was lost. But the, the astronauts luckily did get out in time. Yeah, but uh, the, uh, the Apollo ones didn't sink, they had like big flotation, um, but they had massive, uh, massive flotation Inflatable attachments. Yeah. Yes, you could see them, and even some on the top in case they tipped over. So two yeah. points I'd like to raise about that. One about the Apollo 13 capsule supposedly taken to Russia is that if you've got it in Russia for four months, you can bet your bottom dollar the KGB or whoever has gone over it with a fine tooth comb to have a good look at it and take down the technical details. Possibly, I only say possibly, it's just a hypothetical, they might have placed something on it 
recording equipment, maybe bugs or whatever, so that when it's returned to the Americans, they could record secret conversations inside the capsule. Maybe they, you know, they wouldn't want, want to lose that opportunity. Maybe. Well, they're uh, good at that sort of thing. But that's I mean, that's exactly it. I mean, Espionage, look what they're look what they're doing at the moment. They're trying to they're trying to right now. They're trying to dive down and pick up the uh, the jet from the aircraft carrier that sank the other day. Exactly. Um, the crash they're, in the they're sea. Always yeah. quick to retrieve these things. Uh, the yeah. Americans do the same things, but the Russian aircraft as well. You know, I've heard cases where they've stolen aircraft, the inspiration for the Firefox film, you know, the, with Clint Eastwood. Um, but the thing about the, the Apollo capsules coming backwards, you know, they're coming back at like 25,000 miles per hour um, backwards. They don't have a steering wheel. And somehow they always land within about four miles of the aircraft carrier in the Pacific. Um, and according to the book, One Small Step by the German author, is that all the previous Gemini and uh, similar missions, they always landed way off course. I mean, even the Russians have landed off course when they've returned to Earth. Some of them ended up in China uh, yeah. as well. You know, oh, what's yet, the, the Apollo missions that, yeah. coming backwards, they can't see out the window. They somehow <laughs> managed to backflip and, and land right slap bang next to the aircraft carrier. I mean, that's the equivalent of me being blindfolded holding a dart, throwing it over my shoulder and hitting a bullseye every time, six times, really. Yeah. I just find, the, again, the luck of Apollo. The, um, okay. There's a documentary about Tim Peake, about his mission up into to the International Space Station. He came back on a, on a Soyuz capsule and so they, they land on land, but they um, usually there's quite a lot. The, there's a helicopter is needed to go and pick them up because they, they come down in a remote, remote part of Kazakhstan um, near the Cosmodrome, near the space center there, but it's usually quite a long helicopter flight because they can't they can't hit it on the nose every time. They usually like about I think it's like a hundred square mile error margin of error or something like that. Marcus, you probably know more about that. Yeah, well, the for any spacecraft to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, especially coming back from lunar orbit, as you say, they are entering the Earth's atmosphere, which is only. 30, 40 miles up by the time they hit the atmosphere. They have to enter it at six and a half degrees to the surface of the Earth so that they will come in and they will burn off the heat or burn off the, uh, the speed with the heat. And it produces an enormous amount of heat. So if they're coming back over land, they don't have any option to change direction. They have to continue on the path that they have set themselves. Now, one of the problems of re-entering at that sort of speed is they would have to do what's called a flip. Uh, a, what's, the, what's the phrase used? When they come in, they bounce off the atmosphere. Air braking. That's right. To slow down the craft so that they can come in at a slightly slow, slower angle. But by bouncing off the atmosphere, which is quite a common thing to do, uh, meteors do it as well, they, they then lose track of where they are, because how far do they bounce off? And how far do they then travel? It depends on the speed. So there's a continual problem with finding out where the actual re-entered spacecraft is. And there'll be the first, the first nation to actually do a return from lunar orbit was the Soviet Union with, I think it was uh, Luna 15, is it Luna 15? Yeah. No, no, it was Zon 5, that's right, Zon 5, where they returned these animals and, and plant and things. That was the first time it had ever happened. Apollo 8 was much later than that, was, was later than that. So they had to try to work out how to get the spacecraft back from lunar orbit. The spacecraft don't have brakes. As you say, they don't have steering wheels either. So it's, it's basically hit and miss. Are they going to get the right angle? Hmm. Skip re-entry. That's what I'm talking about. That's skip it. Yeah. If skip re-entry is done properly, yes, it will reduce the speed to the point where it can be controlled much better than just a straight re-entry. Now, Apollo didn't do skip re-entry. They couldn't handle it. They, couldn't, they didn't have the technology to deal with it. So all Apollo craft came back with direct entry, sap straight into the atmosphere, slow down, parachutes out into the sea, collected big heroes. Mm. Now, whether that's correct or not, 
or whether they just dropped out of an aircraft so five or six miles up because you wouldn't actually see an aircraft at five miles up mm. it's what mm. 30 40 thousand feet up it's like trying to see somebody on the top of mount everest that's thirty thousand feet mm. highly unlikely you will yeah, you can't, when they're that far away, yeah, you can't. Yeah, but that, it would explain. That would explain if they were really were landing within like four miles of the USS Hornet or whatever aircraft carrier they were using. That would explain it because from if you're dropping something like a command module with parachutes from that altitude, you probably could get within four miles of your target, depending right. on wind direction. But you know, you get wind directions another problem. You know, you'd, all these factors have to be taken into account. Yes, but from a you could do it quite accurately from a high flying aircraft. So that means so so what was it, guys? I mean, this is the question: Were those command modules really flying straight back from the moon without any? After you, when you once you ditch the service module, you don't have any directional thrusters. Yeah. Um, or were they dropped from a high flying aircraft? Well, can, can I get my, you know, um, in the documentary by Aaron Rainin, did we yeah. go? He went to the boat. The guy who met the astronauts when they first opened the door, you know, and he interviewed that guy, and they did have they did have a radar on that ship to track when the ship the command module first entered. So you know, in Aaron Rannon's opinion, he interviewed that guy to find out whether that guy was lying or not. Did you really see the astronauts? And his conclusion was that guy is not a liar. So. So, you know, if you think about the compartmentalization thing, some people were in on the hoax and some people were not, right? So their job, the people who were in on the hoax, their job was to convince the people who were not in on the hoax. And if there are some guys sitting on the ship and they can track the thing coming down from space, as far as they know, it came from the moon. But whether it came from just low Earth orbit, they would have no idea. Yeah, exactly. And you'd have to have real astronauts in the in the in the command module i mean they'd have to put people in there to make it convincing because then if they didn't everyone on the ship would know that there was something amiss yeah. mm. and it's also be... interesting that that okay again that the, the case of uh apollo 17 who were presumably out there for a, a lot longer like 10 days or something out in space and on the moon and things like that is that they come back and and they step onto the ar uh, aircraft carrier with no problems of gravity they they've They've acclimatized the gravity pretty much straight yeah, away. That's the uh, the the Soyuz astronauts can't do that. They have, that's to, right, carry. They have to sit in chairs and exactly. I mean, I know that a lot of these Soyuz people have been in space for like six months and things like that, which is perfectly understandable. But you would think, I mean, let, let's take an example. When you go on a fairground and you're being whizzed around on something for maybe five minutes ride or something, and then you get off, you're a little bit dizzy on your feet. Well, certainly I am. Now, I know these Apollo astronauts have been spun around and all sorts of things, but still, you would have some sort of problem with gravity yeah. once you've been in space for 10 yeah. days. I was just thinking, now, you could you could argue that the astronauts on the ISS, they're up there for six months at a time, and so their body acclimatizes to low gravity. What about Helen Sharman? Helen Sharman, who was the first British person in space, she was technically, technically not an astronaut, but she was a passenger, but she was only up on the ISS for about a week, she only went, she went up there with the change of crews. So mm. did she have to be carried from the Soyuz craft or did she just walk normally? Mm. I, I don't know if that's because she landed you know on the William Soyuz. William Shatner got sick. <laughs> did he? Oh, dearie me. <laughs> well, the, the other guy that went with him got killed in an aircraft crash like less than a week after their flight, which was, I don't know if you know that. That was the guy that went with him. Mm. Uh, I think he was Dutch. I can't remember the network. It might have been from New Zealand. I can't remember the nationality of him. But the guy that went up with Shatner at the four crew, um, some millionaire or something, he died literally like a week later after that flight uh, with the uh, Elon. Was No, it was the, the Amazon guy, Jeff Bezos. Uh, rocket, oh, wasn't it? it's just, uh, so yeah. is that, uh, that just a coincidence or I don't know, did... Did he see the Earth was flat? Oh God, steam comes out of. Charity. I think he saw the green screen. Um, <laughs> no, nah, no, nah. I'm sure it's a genuine flight, but it's yeah. just a bit of a weird thing, you know, that he died. You know, he went in a really precarious, dangerous kind of flight, 
and he survived it only to get killed by an aircraft. It's quite a weird thing that all these people that go into space and they make these missions and then a lot of them die afterwards yeah. uh, of, of something so so straightforward like yeah, like Yuri uh, Gagarin did didn't yeah, he? Yeah, exactly. Was, yeah. Again, plane crash. Yeah. But you know, on the seriously though, I mean, it does indicate something. I'm with with uh, with William Shatner. Um, he he threw up. Now he was only in microgravity for ten minutes because it was a par- it wasn't he didn't go into orbit. It was a parabolic flight. It was a ballistic trajectory. Uh, he just went up and came down. He's only in microgravity ten minutes, and then he had to get back into the seat uh, for the for reentry. But even that short time disorientated his balance system so much that he ended up feeling nausea. And I know a lot of people on the vomit comet do. And that's literally you get like about one and a half minutes of microgravity for every every single stoop that the aircraft does. Mm, mm. So it's pretty clear that zero gravity does adversely affect people. And if someone's just going to get out of a capsule, wave to everyone as they're getting on the little rubber dinghy and sort of like sit there looking like leaning back or everything, because they, they, I've seen them doing that and then they walk calmly into the decontamination chamber with their gas masks on and things like that and i think how it, it should make people ask questions you know they're, they're not even like they're not even wobbling they're not even staggering yeah they're walking yeah. Normally. yeah can yeah. i tell yeah can i tell one more story regarding this apollo 17 yeah so because because earlier uh he was talking about a museum issue so Apollo 17 was when the tire flap broke off and they put a map on it, right? Oh, yeah, on the fender thing, yeah. So so the official story is that at the end of the mission, he grabbed the map and he grabbed the broken tire flap and brought them back to Earth. And so they were sitting in a museum for a long, long time. There was a display in one museum that so this is the map that he used, and this is the tire flap which broke off. So that was on display in a museum for a long time. And then people realized, wait a minute, if you look at the photos, the tire flap is this long, but the flap in the museum is only that long. It's a different flap from the one that was actually, you can see in the pictures. You know? So they got rid uh-huh. of that museum exhibition uh-huh. really quick. Huh. Interesting. Good point. Mm. And also, mm-hmm. if they were using duct tape, which I believe they were to repair <laughs> it, to, to put the map on, they had a bit of duct tape. Duct tape doesn't work in a vacuum. It's made of a liquid. So it would immediately outgas and the thing would fall off. And they expect us to believe that duct tape can work in a vacuum. NASA knows that it can't. They've actually done a report on it. So duct tape cannot work in a vacuum. So how did they fix that particular mudguard? It's a mystery. One more to add to the continual mysteries of Apollo. Okay, so I wanted to share with you this little presentation. And it has what I call smoking guns. So. Before I start, um, I want to mention that the the way I did this is the opposite from the way American Moon does it. American Moon starts with debunking the debunkers and then goes into the smoking guns. But I've turned that thing around, starting with the smoking guns and then finally the debunking. So like, for example, like in the American Moon, they start off with the hardest question to answer. Why didn't the Russians blow the whistle? So they start off with the big debunking the debunkers. And I'm going to put that at the end, okay? Mm-hmm. So I just want to start off with the smoking guns first. Let me introduce this first smoking gun. Okay, so that's the video there called the docking. And in this video, you're seeing a clip of a toy you know just a a hollywood studio prop you know
and it, you can tell it's a Hollywood studio prop because the antenna falls down due to gravity. So you yeah. can tell that they're in Earth's gravity. And the debunkers, you know, can't really debunk this one. They've tried. They said, oh, we've adjusted the speed. And it's like, no, this video comes directly from the, you know, NASA webpage. And when you watch it on YouTube and all the documentaries have this exact same clip and the speed is exactly matched to the audio. So if they try to like slow the film down so the thing falls slower and say, oh, it's not gravity, you can tell it won't work because then it, the video won't match the audio anymore. Mm -hmm. So this is a pretty, one of the biggest smoking guns of them all. You know, there's really, if somebody has seen this, you know that they're faking it. So it's pretty hard to even believe in the moon landing anymore after you've just seen one smoking gun. Okay. So anyway, but but I want to keep going. There's a, uh, there's, there's a couple problems with this video. So uh -huh. the first problem is not only the gravity is making the antenna fall, but another problem comes is when the craft is moving, but there's no exhaust plumes. So in space, if a ship is going to move or change the course, there has to be exhaust plumes coming out, right? So there's no exhaust plumes there in these ships. And why not? Because <laughs> they're not real spaceships, you know? And you can see thruster firings on the, the Soyuz, all uh, automatically controlled by its onboard computers as it uh, prepares uh, to park itself for a short period of time, uh, just a couple of hundred meters uh, to the aft of the Zvezda service module. So this is the chemical equation for what's going on in those yeah. thrusters, okay? So, so you have this hypergolic fuel, the C2H12N4, plus the reactant, the N2O4, and then you get the byproducts. You get a byproduct of CO and the nitrogen and H2O. This is the actual chemical reaction of what that hypergolic fuel is. Okay, so the CO, carbon monoxide, is is uh, invisible, invisible. So you wouldn't see that. And the nitrogen is also invisible. You wouldn't see that. But the H2O will appear as a steam. Okay. So that's what you're seeing, you know, when you see the Soyuz crafts coming in, you're seeing the H2O steam coming off of this hypergolic fuel. So we must see that also in the Apollo docking scenes, which we don't. So there's two TV clips in there. The first clip is from Earth to the Moon, very, very, very popular, on, you know, that everybody in America is watching now. And when the when you see the docking scenes or the undocking, you always see the exhaust plumes, right? Which is what you're supposed to see. Here you go. Probe. Extend. Release. Beautiful. Neil, you got four down and lock. Houston, the Eagle has wings. I think you got a pretty fine looking flying machine there, Eagle. Despite the fact you're upside down. Somebody's upside down. You guys take care now.
So in a sense, you know, they they did a whole reenactment of the Apollo films, Apollo landings, to as realistically as they possibly could, and they put the exhaust plumes in there. So the, in a sense, they're almost whistleblowing on NASA because NASA should also have exhaust plumes. And why they're putting it on the TV show but not on the NASA clips, right? And the second one, um, the second video clip comes from For All Mankind. And that also shows the exhaust plumes when the ships are undocking. And then the interesting thing is when the ship is landing, you see that the big flame and it leaves an exhaust crater, a burning, it burns a hole in the, in the surface, so it leaves a big exhaust crater. So this is a mainstream television show, and they're showing exhaust craters where they're supposed to be exhaust craters. So is that why number three? Did NASA not input exhaust craters? <laughs> So it's this one here. That one. So I just described that video. It's called the Two TV. Yeah. Okay. So now we're coming into the next thing. This is a recent, just very recent. In the last month, Elon Musk quoted, "He's concerned about the Starship engine exhaust digging a big ditch on the moon." So that's a quote from Elon Musk. So Elon Musk knows that if you're going to send a spaceship to the moon, and the exhaust is a keeping you from just smashing, you know, keeping you up in the in the air, then you're going to land, it's going to leave a big crater. Everybody should know that. It's going to leave a ditch as you get closer and closer to the surface, right? And the closer you get, the deeper that ditch is going to be. This is a very interesting web page. It's just a link to a web page. It says height above the surface at the engine shutdown. So this is a whole discussion about the different Apollo missions, Apollo 11, Apollo 12, Apollo 14, Apollo 16, Apollo 17, and how close they were to the surface before they shut down the engines. And it's a whole discussion, okay, this craft, on this flight, they shut down early so the, the ship landed harder. And on this flight, they kept the engines on all the way till just above the surface, so it was a very soft landing. And all these people are discussing, you know, the milliseconds of how it shut down and and the, and how the it affected the landing, and even how you know there was one trip where the engine actually hit the surface. You know, they go into all these details. They're talking such thing, but not one of them mentions the fact that there's no exhaust crater there. <laughs> you know, these are like scientists who are examining all of these Apollo landing sites and and the photograph under the engine, you know. And, Examining how close the the engine is to the surface according to when they shut down. And how. So this is the I believe this is Apollo 15 takeoff, and you can see that there's a spotlight behind the ascent craft, right? Because mm -hmm. it's filming its it's filming its own shadow on the ground as it's lifting off. So. So this is a very interesting special effect where they had a, a fake, like a model craft, and there was a camera inside that model craft, and the whole thing was lifted up into the air, probably by a crane, and they had a spotlight behind the craft so that the craft would always have a very sharp shadow on the ground. This lift off, automatic. You watch the video of it, then you see the craft rising up, and the spotlight is right behind the craft all the way up. So that means the spotlight is moving along with the craft. So this is huge smoking guns here. You also don't see this scatter effect universally. For example, in orbital, in many of the other lunar surface photographs, it doesn't appear. It also doesn't appear in um, any of the orbital images as well, even the, even the very low ones. Uh, which indicates that it's not, if, if it was a surface scatter effect, you'd see it all the time, like you do if you're taking photos on the beach when there's ripple, when the sand is rippled. You see get it in every single photo. You don't with Apollo, which indicates different lighting effects were used for different shots. And, is this uh, definitely from a Hasselblad or is it from the film? No, 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 no. Based in the window? The, it's from those those video cameras that are supposedly in the windows. In the windows, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
but still you wouldn't get this they kind of corrected on 16 they they in on 15 they realized they messed up and on 16 they tried to correct it by using a different kind of lighting so it wouldn't be so obvious that it was going up with the shift so on mm. 16 they actually did a much better job and but on 17 they kind of did a halfway job 17 is not as bad as 15 but in 17 you can still see the sun rising up with the ship yeah and also by apollo 15 they had obviously got rid of the sheep that are there in this shot um <laughs> <laughs> oh, what are those things they're, they're not in a pen <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're chasing the shadow <laughs> oh it's weird shadows don't work that way okay uh, right, so also mannequin. this next one, this is mannequin. The mannequin is also a film. This is the same mannequin which was used on the video. You can see his arm is still in the same position yeah. as he was in the in the video. So this is a series of photo shots, photo shots that were shot with their cameras, supposedly. And you still have the same mannequin who was in the video. And there's several of these. So you can look at the next one and the next one. And all of them, you see the same mannequin with his arm stuck in the same position. So is this, um, is this a picture of a, of a moving rover or just a... Yeah, it was a remote control rover and they had a mannequin in the seat. Well, you can keep going. I've got several yeah. of these. So you can see his arm is in the same place. Yeah, yeah. So again, and these are just examples of the same mannequin. Mm sitting in the same rover with his arm in the same position. Yeah, and, they do it on um, all of them. Yeah, on all of them. You know, his, his right hand is on the little steering stick, mm. but it's actually not on the steering stick. It's actually just hovering a few centimeters above the steering stick, and the left arm is just dangling there in the midair. So you can't attribute it to, say, the personal habit of a particular astronaut that just drives with his arm sticking out, because obviously that particular habit seems to be carried over into each mission so, so i think they used the same dummy and same mannequin on both yeah. two different missions yeah they only had budget for one action man or gi joe or whatever they were called <laughs> okay. okay so this is this is the seventh the smoking gun and this is an old the picture that some other people pointed out many years ago i found this on the internet but they did a, they did a, they explained it in a wrong way. So I'm going to try to explain it in a better way, correct way. So the way, the way it is, is that if you look at the, I drew a spotlight on the center of the picture. And there's a, there's a perpendicular line coming out of the spotlight heading towards the astronaut's head, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So we we can say that that astronaut is more perpendicular to the light 
than the other astronaut. And the more perpendicular you are to the light, the shorter your shadow will be. Yep. The less perpendicular you are to the light, the longer your shadow will be. Mm -hmm. So in another way to explain it, if there's two actors standing on a stage set and the spotlight is heavier on one of them, then his shadow will be shorter than the person who's not standing in the spotlight. Mm. And that's exactly what we see here. Mm. So I drew another, I drew this bottom picture to, to illustrate uh, why the shadow will be longer when you're less perpendicular. You can even think of it like if this light was a pointing straight down, like everybody has that experience walking down the street, going from street light to street light. And yeah. as you come under the street light, your shadow gets shorter and shorter and shorter. When you get away from the street light, your shadow gets longer, longer, longer. Yeah. So it's the same way you're coming into that perpendicular position, then mm. your shadow will naturally be shorter. Mm. Interesting. So I just wanted to explain this one a little more clearly. This is probably a, a probably a lot of people looking at this would have picked would have probably picked it up, but intuitively and subconsciously will have noticed this because it just you, you without See, even realizing debunkers, why the debunkers have debunked this so i because the people who were trying to explain it explained it in a wrong way so i'm trying to explain it in the correct way you know so that this can't be debunked this is very clear all right so this is the famous <laughs> oh yeah, this yeah. Nice. so this is the okay the story about this is that the picture on the right was aired by the Indian Space Agency. And it was aired like on a Zoom conference. And then somebody took a screenshot and they put it on Wikipedia. So this is on the picture on the right is supposedly the Indian Chandrayaan. Suppose before it crashed, this is the Chandrayaan 2 just crashed into the moon. But so both of their uh, orbiters crashed. But the second orbiter managed to get some pictures before it crashed. And they claim to have taken a picture of Apollo landing site. Problem is that the picture of this craft, which is sitting there, is different from the LRO craft. So that mm. is that is a absolute proof that NASA is lying with these LRO pictures. Because these are the same craters. You can tell this is the same mm -hmm. lunar surface. And I tend to believe that the picture on the right is not a fake picture. I think that they send unmanned craft. And that is what that unmanned craft looked like. It looks like a surveyor craft. Yeah. And the picture on the left is this LRO Photoshop garbage. You know, it's just ridiculous how, how <laughs> terrible that looks. This is the one that was supposed to be the, the last word, yet uh, Jarrah, he, he, he'd already done his own mock-up of one almost as soon as it was published. And um, right. if he can do that, so certainly I, NASA could do the so same. I, I so actually, I actually tried to contact the people at the Indian Space Agency. I'm like, are you serious? Did your, did your orbiter really take this photo? Because if your orbiter just took this photo, you're blowing the whistle on NASA. So I wanted the, to get uh, their comment, you know, and they, you know, they haven't replied yet. But I hope someday, you know, I can go speak to them because if this is this is India blowing the whistle on America, if this is a really a picture they took of a Apollo landing site, and that's really the craft that's sitting there, then that means, you know, and the important thing is that the craft on the right is a three-legged craft, and the craft on the left is a four-legged craft. Yeah. Oh, if it's three-legged, then it's not a lamb, is it? Yes, yeah, like you said, it's not a lamb. This is a, mm. this is a, this is India. It's a lamb. Completely mm. exposed NASA as liars. Mm. I, I can't see actually any footprint kind of marks either, like the one on the They're left. Not. It was yeah, what the craft? Yeah, yeah. That's right. Well, I mean, it you could say, oh, it's the craft. shadows or whatever. But, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was they, a yeah. three-legged unmanned craft. It's the same as you know. So this is. I believe that that's a true picture. This is how they brought rocks back. They mm. sent unmanned crafts. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah, in that's, fact, uh, Jarrah has made a very strong point about that being uh, a surveyor craft, because that is what it would look like in profile if it was photographed from above. It's, it's basically a, th a three-legged craft. 
as you say, the Apollo craft are not, they're four-legged. So why there is such a big difference? And, and when you get people claiming that the Indian craft have confirmed the Apollo landing, if that's all they're going on, then I think they've got a, a major problem on their hands because that is not they, Apollo craft. Yeah, they just debunked the Apollo landing, but they're hoping that people don't research this because if you look closely, it's obvious it's a different ship. Different ships sitting in the same asteroid field. Yeah, exactly. I do, I do wonder if there's a, there's a political motivation behind this. It's possible that... Yeah, uh, so that's India, why India I, won't... won't, yeah. won't reply to my email that's it they, they they published this image but they've just said look we're not going to say any more about this matter some people are going to spot it where they'll be laughed off but the point is that um it doesn't it, you see just two distinct structures on top of this so it's probably not an exact surveyor but it's, it is obviously some kind of three-legged lander though um and it's not an apollo lem it's the detail the details here are just um you can see clearly there is something sticking up from it and it's casting a shadow. You can see the shadow it casts, and you can see it. it looks like a cylindrical structure on the one corner of the top. Yeah, it does. It's a very strange craft, that. And mm. it, cer it certainly doesn't match the Apollo descent stage, <clears throat> which is what they claim it is. The Eagle descent stage, that's Apollo 11. It doesn't match it at all. It may, be, it may have been something that NASA sent up there, um, before Apollo 11, just to land at the location where the Apollo 11 site was meant to land, just may, maybe maybe it was done to design the film sets for mm -hmm. creating the follow. Just say what what does it actually look like? We need to look, make it look at least a little bit like the, the real thing. So they well, sent. They did a very good job. Every photos. crater matches. Yeah, you see, you really set. the actual descent, the Apollo 11 descent footage is very very well put together. It does match what you see on the moon. What is really on the moon, and of course, well, you, the, it matches you, what you see on the LRO images. It yeah, I would see. Oh, it doesn't. Oh, but these, this, the skeptics often claim that that is proof that Apollo Eleven is real, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't necessarily have to be. All it proves yeah. is that they were tr they were attempting to create realistic sets on Earth to resemble what they believed or or closely resemble what was actually on the moon at the location. Hmm. That's not proof that it really was Apollo Eleven, so, and maybe yeah, this, they, whatever this they, is. Yeah, they had the, the plan, okay, when we get out of the ship, we're going to do this and that, and they knew where all the footprints were. So when they made the LRO images, they just made it according to what the official story was. Yeah, it, if this is a real image of the landing site with a different kind of craft, it's, it's probably something that NASA sent there just to, just to help them make a more realistic looking film. Okay, okay. so... I, I want to comment on this next. This is a video. Mm -hmm. It's called the UHT, which stands for the Universal Hand Tool. <laughs> Somebody just recently discovered this, and it's it's a huge smoking gun. So what you're seeing is he's he says he's going to throw this hand tool, and when he throws it, the hand tool takes off on a wire. There's a string pulling it out. And his hand is not even touching it. Yeah. So the hand tool and his hand moves. He's pretending like he's throwing it because he's pretending, but his hand is not even anywhere close to the thing he's throwing. Okay, Bob, the alignment's good on the heat floor, and I've got the uh, UHT out. Jack, you need this? Uh, you better leave. Save it. Save it. I'm going to leave it right here by the out step. Save it. Careful. Gee, many! I just threw it right here in this little little ditch. Careful. Gee, many! I just threw it right here in this little little ditch. Yeah. This is a huge smoking gun here. Okay. If you haven't seen it. Pop that in then. And then we got Apollo 11 okay. Shadow. So we'll pop that in. <clears throat> okay. So this is a very 
this is I don't I wouldn't say that this is a smoking gun, but this is uh, an interesting story which we should be aware of. So this is the famous AS eleven forty. What is it? Fifty-eight, forty-nine. Fifty-eight, forty-nine. Yeah. <clears throat> so, so what what you're seeing here? This camera does not have camera reticles. This is the one photo out of the entire roll that does not have camera reticles. So when you zoom in to the to the ground, there is no camera reticle. So how is that possible? Now there's a there's a whole discussion on the NASA webpage. As to how this was possible. <clears throat> so the official story was that the Buzz was taking pictures with his camera and then all of a sudden he took the film roll out, he changed cameras, put the film roll in a different camera with no reticles, took one photo, took it out, brought back the reticle camera and put it back in there. Okay so this is the official story. <laughs> why, why would he do that then? <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense, you yeah. know. We're ready for cameras <laughs> like that. And we can prove that they're lying. So you have to zoom in on that rock. So this is an art. Somebody tried to cover up their mistake, and they added a reticle. Said, no, 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 the reticles are there. You see uh, that? They tried to, they tried to line. cover up. They tried to cover up their their tails yeah. by adding this. Reticle. That's far too big for a reticle, and it hasn't got the horizontal. It's yeah, just a line. But, yeah. but see, the thing is that, that some NASA trolls have come to me and said, "Oh, I'm wrong. There are reticles there." And they they sent this to me. He sent this to me as proof of a reticle. Now I took that photo he sent me, and and if you left, if you look at the next photo I did in the folder, mm -hmm. it shows that this is a photoshopped image. Okay. So this is if so you Where can see go, this yeah. was made by Adobe Photoshop. Yes? Yeah. And you can see the date. Oh, 2009. 2009. Yeah. Okay. So this image, this this was part of there was a university, get that university that hosted all the Apollo images. So so there's really two main sources, well three main sources for the Apollo images. There's the Apollo web page, and then there's this university web page, and then there's, what is it, the Flickr account or something? Mm -hmm. These are the three main sources for Apollo images. So that NASA troll who was trying to prove that there's reticles, he said, okay, go to the college web page and download their image and you'll see reticles. So I did. I went to the university web page. I download the image, right click. Look at the properties. It says, "Oh, this is the Adobe Photoshop image." So this is a proof that they are covering their. They're trying to cover their butts by adding a reticle, but then they they realized that wasn't working. So then they made up this other story where Neil took the roll out of the camera and put it in another camera for one shot. Hmm. Mm, very strange. But all the all the cameras, all the Hasselblad cameras that were taken to the moon, even though only one of them was used on Apollo 11, they all had reticules in them. So they're all. Well, but the official story is that they had like an inside camera, inside the ship camera, and outside the ship camera. And the inside ship cameras, they never planned to take it out, so they didn't need reticles. That's the official story. It's, it's a bit short-sighted, really. Yeah. <laughs> and it's interesting that they should have to cover it up now. Yeah. So this is a starting. This is a very interesting series. So, so as you can see, the the picture on the left is the original photo, where it's what yeah. I call the man standing under a spotlight, <laughs> and then the picture on the right is the new updated Photoshop version, where the background has been filled in. Yep. Yeah. And oh, you yeah. can see if you if you right click on the image, and you look at the properties. The picture on the left is not Photoshop. And the picture on the right is Photoshop. Right. This was the one we were talking about earlier because um, the one I mentioned earlier, which has the, the the skeptics are trying to explain as a light scatter effect, but obviously they've gone to the they've obviously retouched this photo. Yes. 
because so they, want... they know that it doesn't. Yeah. They know they messed up. And this is the Internet Archive on the top oh, yeah, left is... corner. Yeah. Shows that this is the Internet Archive. So this is Internet Archives tells you which web page hosted this image and when did they host it? Yes? Mm -hmm. So if you go down, you can see exactly who hosted it and when they hosted it. Publication date. Uh -huh. 2009. Yeah. On the NASA web page. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the original. This was the original image that looks like a man standing under the spotlight. So if you go to the next image, then that will be the 2010 version. So this is the one with the nice filled-in background. Yeah. And you can see the date is the 2010. Yes. They've done exactly the same, haven't they? So, so you can. So this is absolute proof that the spotlight photo was uploaded before the non-spotlight photo, yes? On the, okay, on the upper left-hand corner, it says the forensically. Yeah. And what that is, this is a forensic analysis software. Mm -hmm. So we load the original photo into this forensic analysis software, and you, you search for evidence of clone stamping. So oh. on the right side, on the right side, it says clone stamp tool. Right, so clone detector. Okay, so okay, so just so those red and those red lines and those blue dots. If you go back to the picture, yeah, those red lines and blue dots is the software has forensically analyzed this photo and shown where and how the clone detector was used. So this is 100% clear evidence. That this was a photoshopped image mm. because the forensic software has recognized the use of clone stamping. Mm. So they cannot debate whether or not this has been a photoshopped image. Well, oh, that's not a photoshopped image. This is the original. That's the excuse they always make. The original had the nice filled in background, yeah. and the one with the spotlight effect is not the original. No, we just proved beyond a shadow of doubt. This photo came later. This came in 2010, and this photo has been photoshopped. It has been run through a forensic analysis. Is the plan now that from now on, every single book that's published, every single website, every single documentary about the Apollo missions are going to show these these retouched revisionist photographs rather than the originals? And so the originals are going to go down the memory hole because of the work that people like us have done. It's because of the work people like us have done that they've had to do this. They've had to change them because we've been pointing out so many anomalies in the <laughs> photographs. I mean, when when David Percy started looking at the pictures, this was over what 20 odd years ago, 20 plus years ago, when he published his book Dark Moon, he pointed out the the fall off of light, which wasn't real. Now we yeah. suddenly got fall off of light because the, the horizon on the moon will be about two miles away. You would expect it to be illuminated correctly from the foreground <coughs> to the background. <coughs> on the original photographs, that's not. There's a huge difference between the foreground and the background. So NASA, God bless them, have had to come up with something to check, to try to counter these discussions. And they've been going on for so long now. And because NASA are continually having to change their story, and change their pictures, they're becoming found out. They're becoming identified as being fakers because they're having to go back, fake the original photographs to what people say they should be. Mm. And we know a... exactly. We know exactly when they did this because the that movie, this Dark Moon, came out in the year two thousand. That's right. And then and then the the all these updated photos, these photoshopped photos were uploaded to the NASA webpage in 2010. So yep. that means it, it took them 10 years to retouch all their photos. They knew they had to do a lot of work. It took them 10 years. And then when they got them all up photoshopped, they just, just uploaded the batch of them in 2010. 
Yeah. They are they are tacitly NASA are tacitly admitting that we proved them. We proved them wrong. We proved them as liars, and now they're just trying to basically retcon the entire history of Apollo to make it to make it fit in, as you say, Marcus. They keep having to change their story just to make it believable for new generations of um, of historians and for viewers because they want they want to try and put this to bed. They want to try and say, well, look, all this stuff about lighting effects weren't true because look here, here are the pictures and yeah. these these researchers these so-called conspiracy researchers in the past got them wrong but of course the images they're going to be showing people will be the ones which they have edited to eliminate the you know digitally to eliminate the mis mistakes that we detected exactly right. that's what's happening yeah. now, yeah. interestingly I, I discuss the moon landings with uh, so i've discussed them with several young people you know people who weren't around at the time obviously it's so maybe 20, 25 years old, something like that. So they're, they're not familiar with, as familiar with the original story as maybe some of us old timers are. And I, I asked them outright, I said, do you, do you think the moon landings happened the way we've been told? And they said, no chance, not a chance. You can, you can tell if the pictures are changed. I mean, these, these people are quite adept at looking at photographs. That's all they do. They look at photographs and they can tell if things are not right. Well, that's good. You know, they understand about Photoshop. And maybe they don't fully understand the detail of it, but they're they're not persuaded that the Apollo missions, as we've been taught 50 odd years ago, happened the way we've been taught. Well, that's good news because it means they have a healthy level of doubt. And also, um, as Raz has demonstrated, the means to detect the changes made can be quite easily uh, can be quite easily made with this clone detector thing. So yep. the that's Good point there. Yeah. So I did three of these analysis on just three of these Apollo 11 photos where I took the original, which has the spotlight effect, and then I took the 2010 Photoshop version and I ran the forensic analysis and showed the absolute proof that this is a Photoshop image. Did that on three, but I could keep going. I could probably do hundreds of them. <laughs> this is the old version. This is the new updated version, which has been Photoshop. And here's the proof of it. How many pictures altogether have they have they altered in this way? Probably hundreds, thousands. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, oh, yeah, yes. This is. A... So the so the guy in the spot who's uh, not filled in, and the guy who is filled in. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed this before. There are a couple like that where you see fill in light not used uniformly. If uh, if the if the uh, lighting effect we see with the Apollo 11 ladder photo was exactly what NASA said, it's just reflection from the surface, then it would be universal. It would be in the, all the photo shots where astronauts are in the shadow. Yeah, of course it would. In all the photos, yeah. And interesting, when you listen back to the Apollo landing where Armstrong's come down the ladder and he says, I'm coming down the ladder now, just another footer, three footer, or he jumps down. One of the first things he says is that he says, I can't hardly see anything. It's very dark here in the shadow of the lens. Yeah. Mm, yeah. You see, if, um, obviously, clearly they've used different lighting effects for these two different images. You know, and so this is the kind of uh, camera fill in lighting. Probably Marcus knows the technical word for this it's reflective. Yeah, it's just uh, just an ordinary reflector, whether it's a silvered reflector or a white reflector. You can tell how much light is put into the face of both right. the girl and, and, and the chap compared to the lady holding the reflector because she's not trying to put it, put light into her face. She's just there to hold the reflector. It, it's a standard photographic practice. There's nothing odd about it, but right. it's on the moon without admitting to it <laughs> is Un, uh, well, let's just say it's uh, illogical, as Mr. Spock so, might say. <laughs> so, so the reason I want to bring this out is because um, I was looking closely at these high resolution images and I did the same forensic analysis and the, uh, <clears throat> the original images don't show this hot spot on the boot so those images are not are not official anymore it, you can't prove where they come from so the the new the new images if you look at the high resolution 
you can tell they're actually not using a spotlight. They're using one of these reflectors. And, and I spoke to some people who are photographers about this and they said, oh yes, this is a reflective. It's not a, it's not a secondary light. It's just a large reflector standing below the guy who's taking the photo. Is yeah. this the, is this the, the, the one that David Groves did, the study David Groves did on the Buzz Aldrin's foot? Yes, yes. yes. But I mean, so the, the the big the white line which indica indices indicates a, a secondary light source was that was that actually added la later for some reason or was that that was on the original as far as i know it was on the original because yeah. i saw it probably late 1990s i saw that picture and it, it yeah. had the hot spot of light on the heel it's right. something i've mentioned quite regularly when i point out these things yeah so the but the problem is that those you cannot find those pictures on the internet archive so you cannot prove where they came from uh, yes we know that nasa has has tried to cheat on these before and this time they got away with it because you see as i just did with my previous example i showed from internet archive when this photo was archived so if so if they managed to get it edited before it went on the internet archives then we can't catch them we can't prove that this photo came from before because we don't have a timestamp on it hmm. I, don't know. I mean the photo will be in in books i mean it's it's probably yeah, some it's of the books, in books got, but, yeah. they, but nasa can always make that excuse well this was a bad scan and so it doesn't look right so we have to catch them on the published photos. That's why you catch it on Internet Archives published as this at this date. Then you can prove this was when it was published. And if there's a flaw in it, they can't uh, hide that anymore. Yeah, yeah. It, it's basically it's it's fairly simple stuff. This it's just that once you point it out to people, they're aware of it. So NASA have to do their very best to try to eliminate some of these anomalies within the photographs. You can see them like uh, trying to cover their tracks. Yeah, I've often wondered what those strange light things are on the top of the pictures. Right, uh, that's why I just showed what what the light should look like according to the what the glare looks like. There should be the bulb kind of sticking out a little bit from the, the housing. As you just said, I mean that's a that's not a round object. That does look like some kind of but like a spotlight, like you said, Raza, it looks like one of those, uh, an artificial lamp with a shade and a bulb. Yeah, we got two two more videos. The first one is um, it's an updated version of examples of when you're supposed to hear sounds and when you're well, of course, you're not supposed to hear sounds, but there's several examples where you can hear the sounds. And this is, uh, you've probably seen this before. Some people have shown one or two examples, but yeah. I have about four examples of where you're hearing sounds when you're not supposed to. Right. In space, since there's no, uh, there's no atmosphere, there's no air, uh -huh. if you bang on something when you're doing your spacewalk, you will not be able to hear that. Trying to fall. Don't wear your hand out. 
shot. Okay, there's one and a half. Good. Doing good. And then the next one is is my uh, new version of the puppets on a string video. And, uh, I wonder if one day that you say that you care if you say you love me madly, I'd gladly be there like a puppet on a string. But I, I did it, this one, all these clips just come directly from American Moon because they have a higher quality video on theirs. So I just took the clips out of American Moon to make this new video. And we got Surveyor, is this one? Okay, so the Surveyor, I've done this before, but um, again, this is the, the real Surveyor on the top took a photo of its feet, right? Yeah. So you can see what the ground looks like. This uh, the photo on the top, I believe, is the real surveyor with the real photo of its feet. And then the photo on the bottom is the fake astronaut who came up to the fake surveyor. And you can tell it's a completely different set. It's not even the same ground, not the same mm. material, the surface. Everything is different. You know, he couldn't have taken that. So, so this is just completely fake image on the left. And, you know, is, the, man. <clears throat> is the is the photo at the top actually taken by the surveyor's own camera? Yeah, its own camera took a photo of its own feet. This is exactly where it landed and where it should be sitting today. But certainly here you've got <clears throat> like a bit bit of a trench or something around this part. There doesn't appear to be any trench around this section of yeah, surveyor's no big rig. rocks either. I don't see yeah. anything. Yeah, there's nothing actually on yeah. the Apollo image of the surveyor that resembles that. Yeah. That structure. You know. Okay. So what's this? So this is the camera, which was used on those um, those first pictures of the moon and the Earth's surface. Was the reason why I'm pointing this out is because this camera has radiation shielding. And it also has a vacuum to protect the film. So if you're going to send a camera into space that has film inside, you need to protect the film. 
And this is a very clear example of how they did that. Mm. So in my opinion, you know, like I said, I've examined all the photos from all of the Apollo missions going away from the Earth, going towards the moon, going away from the moon, going towards the Earth. And they took really amazing photos. But it had to have been taken with this kind of a camera. Could not have been taken with a handheld Hasselblad. <laughs> no way. Mm. Okay. Right, next one. So, are you, uh, Raza, are you saying that all the pot photographs taken from lunar orbit by the various Apollo astronauts were taken with that type of camera? It, it's not just the lunar orbit. It's it's the trans translunar coast and the trans Earth coast, both okay. on the way out and the way in. They're taking photos of the Earth getting away. They're taking photos of the Moon getting closer, closer. Yeah. And so I believe that those are real. But if you're looking through the camera rolls, eventually they switch to the model, the model that's the fake Moon model. So okay. you have real photos of the Moon getting closer to the Moon. And real photos of the Earth getting farther away from the Earth, but when you actually get into supposedly lunar orbit, yeah, then you start getting the pictures of the model, which is in the warehouse, yeah, yeah, and you can tell where the cam where they switch over from real moon to fake moon. It's very obvious when you look through the rolls. Yeah, because if they were using photographic film in space, they'd have to protect it, which we now know is is required. And that is something which has only come out, come out in the last maybe seven or eight years. The photographic film needs to be protected from the vacuum. So on this photo, I showed it before, but on the on the lower left hand corner is the bag and inside the bag are the rolls of the film, which are sitting there in the vacuum of space. Yeah. Yeah. Now. Um, the thing is. A lot of people, you know, the. NASA has tried to cover themselves <laughs> on the on that uh, that uh, documentary where they interview the guy from um, Hasselblad. Yeah. Uh -huh. And mm -hmm. so they're asking him. I mean, what was this camera special and was the film canister special? And he says, yes, we did modify the camera and we did modify the film canisters to put extra protection in there from radiation. That's so he did admit to that. Now the thing is, is that really going to help? You know, if they put like a little layer of lead on the inside of the canister, is that really going to help? <laughs> I doubt it. And then, you know, like this thing like, oh, we kept it in the we kept it in the white bag so that the temperature will go too extreme. You know, they tried to cover themselves, but just in case anybody is not familiar with photographic film, which is what we're talking about, here is a piece of photographic film. It's 35 millimeter film, plastic backed. It has emulsion, which is light sensitive. You can see it's been exposed because I pulled it out of its uh, cassette. But that is the photographic film that was used on Apollo. Photographic film which is damaged by a vacuum. So come along, parrots. I call them parrots. <laughs> Basically, in honor of uh, Neil Armstrong's comment about uh, parrots not being able to fly very well. Nobody has yet explained how photographic film can work in a vacuum. Well, I'm, I'm actually I'm actually waiting for NASA to come up with another kind of retcon story like the others they've done that they actually did use special film, even though we know they did. the earlier researchers will tell you they didn't that uh, even uh, Douglas Arnold, the photographer who was who was interviewed in the Darkmoon documentary. I yeah. mean, he knows all about this sort of thing. because He was on Sky at Night with Patrick Moore and um, he said, no, no, it was just ordinary Kodak film. And Kodak made a big deal out of it, didn't they? They put it on mm. all their posters. So we we were the ones who sent our film to the moon. Yes, we photographed the moon. Yeah. Here it that is. is a, it's a great advertising, a great advertising spot to use, isn't it? It's uh, and they mm. did. They lent on it an awful lot. So it's yeah. not special film. It's normal film. It's normal film. But you, the experiment, and we've talked about it on a previous show. But you, the experiment Aulis did, were actually put in putting some film in a vacuum chamber and that's not half as hard as the vacuum of space but it ruined the film didn't it yeah it did. you can get a proper photo from it yeah it was the it was done by um bob williams over in canada 
and Scott Henderson. They actually went out and bought a vacuum chamber. Wow. And because commercial vacuum chambers don't come, don't have very high levels of vacuum, Tor 10 to the minus three it was able to produce. And even that damaged the film. If you get out to the moon, it's Tor 10 to the minus 12, it destroys film. Mm, so yeah. come on, NASA, you've got to explain how you managed to take all these lovely photographs with the Hasselblad cameras and the Kodak Actochrome film, this stuff, in the vacuum of space without the film being destroyed. They used hassle-free cameras. <laughs> <laughs> like hassle-free camera, yes. <laughs> so I want to come on to this next. Yeah, uh, this is the DAC data acquisition camera. OK, this is what they put on the lunar module. Yes, so there was two kinds of data acquisition cameras. One of them was the digital and one of them was analog. Yeah, so the digital one, yes, you you know, they, they stuck it on a stand and they were filming the camp, the guys, you know, standing near the ship. And they had a wire running all the way back to the ship to provide electricity or the, and so the data signal can yep. go back to yeah. Earth. OK, that's fine. Data acquisition, the digital data acquisition camera, no problem. But this analog one, which I have a picture of here. So the analog ones, that means they have actual film inside. This is a video camera which has video film inside. Now, that suppose most of them stayed inside of the ship right they were filming through the window and that was a film camera but on on this on two of the lunar rovers they were filming him riding in the rover yes oh yeah okay. so so that is the camera this is the camera he used when he <laughs> was riding in the car and then when he got back to the ship he took that camera roll out of that video camera. OK, I, I have another. The next picture is the actual camera roll. We're talking about film camera rather than video camera, just to stop any yeah. confusion because people. No, talk no, no, about... no. This is a video film so, roll. Inside so would it be a video tape then? Look, yeah, look down yeah. on the next. Uh, this, uh, this the DAC three. Next one. This one. OK, like a yeah. video cassette cartridge this type the, of thing. This yeah. is the cassette. Which yeah. had two, which had the roll of film inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's a roll of video film in here, and they took it out on the rover, and there is no protection on this at all. Okay, even if NASA tries to make the excuse, well, the Hasselblads had protection. This one did not have. You can see it very clearly. It's just a tin can they put it inside of. Yeah, 16 millimeter camera. So it's 16 millimeter film by the looks of things. Yeah. So that's actually yeah. is that film or video type? I, I think this it's the film. actual. <coughs> this is the film inside of that camera when they were riding in the car. Yeah. Bouncing up and down. Yeah. Right. No way this could survive the radiation. No, no, because it's, it's again, is that it's not special film. It's, it's just still just normal film. Right. They do a good job of discussing this in the American Moon movie. Yeah, it's, you know how that uh, you know the debunkers try to say that this is a perspective, mm -hmm. but perspective only applies when you're standing in line with the shadows, not at a ninety degree angle. Yeah. You know, like standing on on a train tracks. If you're standing yeah. on the tracks, the tr the tracks converge into the distance. But if you're standing 90 degree angle from the track, the tracks are parallel. Yeah. So, you know, I'm just saying they try to use this argument like, oh, this is a perspective. No, sorry, there's not perspective. You're standing at a 90 degree angle. And then also they'll try to say, oh, there's a big uh, downhill curvature there, which is curving the shadow. No, again, this is just flat land they're standing on there. These differences in shadow di direction can't be explained entirely by perspective. They can only be explained by the presence of a light source close by, not the sun. So you get you get like some massive spotlight, you like you get at sports stadiums because this is obviously a big a big outdoor studio. You'd get like a big light, like you you get for football grounds or baseball grounds and things like that, and set that up and shine it right down onto the where they're filming. Um, these are just a few of the examples which come directly from 
the American Moon movie showing uh, examples of when the return signal was too fast. You know, it mm. must be minimum of 2.6 seconds. But there's these three examples of a 1.1 second, 1.6 seconds, 0.9 seconds, you know, which would have been impossible. Yeah. And, you know, they this they is, also this tried is... to cover the, they tried to cover themselves by adding some extra noise in the Apollo Circus Journal clips. Yeah. You know. But this, this is, is the original footage, which has this time frame, which is too short. Uh, this, this is a big smoking gun because you're dealing with something that is inevitable because of the laws of physics and the speed of light, the speed of electromagnetic radiation. You can't check, you know, there's no way any skeptic could explain this. If, if it wasn't such a big deal, why are some of them being corrected and some <clears> haven't? <throat> Which is mm. the weird thing. They should leave it all as it is, really, shouldn't they? Yeah, I mean, editing out the, the gaps, but... Um... You see, you see them in, a, in association with the images. Now, the, the videos haven't been edited. The videos, you just see them bouncing around and they're talking at the same time as you see them um, doing so mm. on, on the moon. Mm. It's like you can't edit the sound and then add that soundtrack to the video because then everything will be out of sync. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is why I say we, we have to catch them. If you want to catch them, you have to, you have to be able to document that you're using an original source material. Same thing yeah. that I did with my photos being photoshopped. He did with this by catching the original audio tracks. Then they mm. can't pretend like, oh, this one, this edited later, this edited version came before. No, it doesn't. You mm. catch, you have to have a timestamp, and then you can catch them this, when you did it. Yeah, that's okay. a good point. Yeah. That one there, it's like the window on the space station, I think. That one. Is that right? Oh yes. yeah, where you see the stars through the yeah. So yeah, so you can so you can see the entire Earth, and when you look up, you can see the stars. Um, oh, yeah. So yeah. you know, I have that a video clip of the ISS astronaut talking about seeing stars from space, and you can see it on the daytime, right? Yes. And here's a proof of that. The sky is. Uh... A deep black uh, when viewed from the moon as it is when viewed from uh, cislunar space, the space between the Earth and the moon. The sky, of course, was, uh, was black, but it uh, had sort of a velvet sheen to it. I've often tried to explain the difference between darkness, when you turn out the lights and it's dark in here, or blackness. Blackness is the endlessness of it all. It's hard to comprehend. We were never able to see stars from the lunar surface or on the daylight side of the moon by eye without looking through the optics. Uh, I don't recall during the period of time that we were photographing the Sona Corolla what, uh, what stars we could see. I don't remember seeing any. The biggest visual surprise was just how black the sky was. <laughs> you have a brilliant sun, brighter than any sun you normally would see even here in New Mexico. Uh, you have uh, these, uh, these extraordinarily high mountains. We were in a valley deeper than the Grand Canyon. But then you have this black sky, a sky blacker than black, as the old Vit Viticon expression used to be. If you ever want to understand what the infinity of space and the infinity of time is, you have to stand on the surface of the moon and look at the Earth. And look at the Earth, it's all its splendor, it's all its beauty, a three-dimensional Earth surrounded by this infinite blackness. The infin infinity of space and time, which goes on forever, and it's it's a blackness that that surrounds you, standing in sunlight. That blackness surrounds you. Whilst in space, have you ever looked away from Earth into the black void? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, because yeah, you time. can see yeah, because yeah. you can see the stars. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, and, and uh, pretty much all the time you can see yeah, the stars. Yeah. It's it's not a black cool void. Thing. I mean, it's black, but there's all kinds of little polka dots. There's all the there's all the stars there, and the cool thing is about it, you can see it during the day. And that when you look when I look out at the stars and I see you know so many stars and planets and. And we have to realize that in space, without the intervening atmosphere. <clears throat> The heavens are ten times as bright, stars ten times as numerous, uh, because there's no uh, atmosphere to block, block the light. First of all, you see stars in the daytime. 
And the other thing that's unusual about the stars is they don't twinkle. They're brighter, but they're different. And a lot of things different about them. One, you don't have the atmospheric distortion, so they don't twinkle, right? So you see lots of points, and you see lots of points, and that literally millions of them. Uh, you know, there's you know the thing about Carl Sagan: billions of billions of stars. There really are billions and billions of stars, and you can see them. In fact, they're so numerous, it's very difficult to pick out the constellations you and I see here on the ground. Of course, in this photo, they have the lights turned off inside the ship. So in yeah. the next photo, you can see the lights turned on. So this is the side window. You know, the space shuttle has two windows, the bottom window, which is facing the Earth, and then the yeah. side window. Mm -hmm. And so you can see they have the lights turned on inside of the ship. So then you won't see the stars because of the glare from yeah. the wall of the ship. You can see a flash. Right. But, I mean, you can see them yeah. with your eye, but you cannot see them with the camera. Point is, I'm trying to get to this point about the astronauts saying that they could not see stars in space. Mm. So I have that video, and you've got these Apollo astronauts saying that the sky is all black, you can't see any stars. And then you've got the ISS astronauts saying, oh, yes, you can see stars all the time in the daytime. These ones. Yes. You know? So um, so I want to kind of just try to, I've got a better understanding of this debate now, so I want to kind of clarify that. The question is not, can your camera pick up stars? Okay, that's not the question. The question is, can your eyes see the stars, right? That's the important question, because you've got these Apollo astronauts saying, no, it was, the sky was black. Okay, it's not a question of cameras. Cameras can't pick up stars, that's clear. But can your eyes pick up stars? So, first thing to answer this question is, okay, if you were standing on the moon, you would not have a glass plane in front of your face, okay? Because if you were standing on the moon with a glass plane in front of your face, your face would be radiated immediately and you would turn into a mutant ninja turtle. Okay? <laughs> so the thing is, you cannot stand on the moon surface with a glass plate. If you're going to stand on the moon surface, you need an Iron Man suit that's made out of a radiation-proof material, and you have to have a computer screen on the inside so you can see where you're going. You cannot have a spacesuit with a glass mask. It's not going to be possible. That's why they're having so much problem now with their spacesuit, they're trying to put a glass plane there. Glass will not protect from radiation. You're going to need an Iron Man suit. So, so the whole question of can you see stars on the moon surface is an invalid question because you can't even have a spacesuit with a glass plane there. But let's just imagine for a moment that you have an Iron Man spacesuit that has a metal mask and it will slide open for a minute and reveal a glass plane so you can actually look up. Yeah, you'll probably die, but you know, say you just open it up for a minute, just to, oh, can I really see stars? <laughs> okay, so that's the question. You know, if you could just, if somehow you could manage to have a glass on your spacesuit and see, yes, you would also see stars on the lunar surface, right? Because <clears throat> there's no atmosphere, right? So that you're not going to get a blue sky in the daytime. You're going to see stars in the daytime. Now, you can say, okay, but if you're looking up in, with the sun directly in your face, then the glare from the sun will kind of blind you so you can't see the stars. That's, their, that's the excuse they're using. Oh, you can't see the stars because the sun is so bright. Right. But you have to remember the Apollo missions, they chose the time where the sun was the lowest on the horizon, right? So all you'd have to do is just look away from the sun and there'd be millions of stars, right? So the question, can you see stars on the lunar surface with your eyes? Well, first of all, you wouldn't survive that, but if you could survive it for a second or two, yes, you would also see stars. So they're lying about uh, three things, okay? Neil, uh, Neil Armstrong says, uh, you know, we couldn't see stars on on the lunar surface. And the second lie 
We could not see stars in the cis-lunar space between the Earth and the Moon. And then the third lie is that we could not see stars during the solar corona experience, experiment. Okay, so they told three lies. And so I have examples of that is the next picture. Yeah. So this is the what 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 Apollo 11 calls the solar corona experiment is when the sun is hidden behind the moon. It means mm. you're 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 Looking photographing the corona of the sun <clears throat> as it's just peeping out from the side of the moon. So Apollo that's what Apollo 11 referred to as the solar corona experiment. And here is a picture of it on the ISS, where you've got a, a lunar eclipse, and the sun is peeping out from the side of the moon. And what do you see? You see the entire Milky Way there. Yeah. Um, but thank you very much, Rasa. Very, very Cheers, interesting. And enjoyable. Yeah, thanks, thanks Rasa. That's great. Very, very interesting stuff. You've okay. ident yeah, cheers, Mike. Thanks. You've identified a lot of the smoking guns, and I think we can put it across to NASA now for them to... Uh, spike those guns if they can which i doubt they'll be able to never mind we'll look forward to it yep i'm looking forward to seeing what they what new uh, edits and re revision they do as a result of this program oh i'm sure there'll be plenty of plenty of them to say i mean there are, there are a few nasa parrots out there who i'm sure will jump all over it and say we don't know what we're talking about but that, that's that's normal for the moment Let's yeah. just not worry about it. We'll certainly be triggering members of the face group. Some certain some some members of the Facebook group will get very triggered by this video, I think. Oh good. How nice. <laughs> Do you want to take us out then, Ben? Yeah, sure. Okay. So every time someone comes up to us and thinks this has all been done to death, we've everything that needs to be said about the Apollo program has been said, and that all the hoax evidence has already been uncovered. Well, they're obviously wrong because there is more. There's always more out there to look at it seems there's an almost infinite supply of deceit in the Apollo record for researchers like us to dig up uh, i think uh, this is all this is new material this is all very interesting this is going to once again reopen a debate which has never really closed and however much nasa want to close this case they can't i'd like to thank neil geddes ward our esteemed producer and director and our two apollo experts marcus allen mr nexus magazine and right all the way from China, Raza Vihari. That was a very good presentation. Um, yeah. So uh, the smoking guns are indeed still smoking. Thank you very much, gentlemen, indeed. Okay. Um, this okay. is the Apollo Detectives, and I am Ben Emlyn Jones. Thank you all for watching. Don't forget, keep an eye out because there's more to come. <laughs>